Please take your Bibles and we're going to read together from God's Word from the book of Acts and reading in chapter 16 and verses 16 to 24. Acts 16, verses 16 to 24. Let us give our attention to the Word of God as it is read publicly. Luke is speaking at this point as the one who is the author of the book of Acts and he says, we, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. This is God's holy word, and we look to him to... Uh, give us the aid of his spirit to consider it together shortly. We turn to Acts 16 again this evening um, in, in just a, a brief series we're doing of these evening services uh, under the, the general title, Three Unlikely Conversions. Uh, three people who, during Paul and Silas and Luke's visit to uh, Philippi, uh, as they ranged far and wide in their preaching. Um, Luke, the author of, of Acts, um, records for us three individuals um, who at face value did not necessarily seem like obvious candidates for hearing the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, believing in him and finding salvation. Three very different individuals, one religious, one completely irreligious, one, as we shall see this evening, who um, was... Uh, an enslaved girl, perhaps not from Philippi, perhaps far away from home and family. Uh, but each of these three individuals, as they uh, came under the sound of, 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 the, of the gospel through the message preached by Paul and Silas, um, that they, they came face to face with their deepest need and they came face to face with God's only answer to our deepest need through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come this, this evening to look at, at the slave girl um, um, who was horribly exploited uh, and used by her masters and yet who was graciously saved by the message of Christ and him crucified. There's a, a lovely and, and a powerful line uh, in Timothy Dudley Smith's well-known hymn, Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided uh, in which, 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 which says, Lord, for our land, in this our generation, spirits oppressed by pleasure, wealth, and care. You're, you're this, this generation of which we are a part, perhaps more than any other that has ever lived, um, is, is a generation that has been incredibly blessed in material terms by what is what we can, we can access and what we can enjoy. Um, e even those who um, are, are living on benefits, even those who are living, if you like, at, uh, at the more difficult end of the economic spectrum, nevertheless, that there is still enough provided for them that they can enjoy a reasonable standard of life compared to what have been true in our grandparents' generation and our great-grandparents' generation. 
Uh, if, if it was Harold Macmillan who was able, able to tell Britain under his premiership, you have never had it so good, we have never had it so good, that, then, that, then that's just taken to a whole new level for our generation. If, if, if um, Harold Macmillan was to um, be reincarnated and, 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 and step into the world of our day, and, and, and look at the homes that we live in, the cars that we drive, the, the, the opportunities that we have, he would be, he would be, his breath would be taken away. And yet never has there been a generation that has been so oppressed in spirit. Never has there been a generation that has been so impoverished in terms of its appreciation of life and its enjoyment of life. And we are indeed a generation where our spirits are oppressed by pleasure, wealth, and care. The language well captures the fact that people are actually held hostage to the good things of life, what appear to us the desirable things of life. And, and, and so often it's the case, and, and every one of us, I'm sure, have had the, had the, the experience. You know, we, we fall prey to the advertising industry. Um, you know, it, it comes to the point where we are told um, so many times, you really need this product. By this, your life will be turned around, whether it by a new brand, be a new brand of shampoo or whether it be some other kind of convenience. By this, and your life will be revolutionized. And we fork out the requisite amount of money and we come home with our, our hopes raised and, and within days we are disappointed. It, it doesn't provide the satisfaction, the fulfillment that we were told it would. We are held hostage. And, and of course, the great irony in that is the fact that we are, we are so obsessed with being free that we, we have uh, a measure of liberty, not least because of our economic freedoms and our, our, our standard of living. We have freedoms that, that previous generations um, did not know. Uh, and yet, more than ever, we feel ourselves held hostage to circumstances and to factors in life that we know we cannot control. So the next person that we meet as we follow in Paul's footsteps during this visit to Philippi is someone who was anything but free. Anything but free. She was a girl who was a slave not only in, in one sense, but in two senses. Uh, she, was, um, she was enslaved because she had been taken from her home, perhaps as a prisoner of war, uh, perhaps through a raiding party, through bandits who made it their business to capture unsuspecting individuals and take them off into a life of slavery, and, 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 and don't underestimate what it meant to be a slave in the ancient world. It didn't mean simply being a domestic servant, um, where you had to do menial jobs around the house, but at least you got a mod modest remuneration for it. No, to be a slave, you were to be a piece of property. You could own a human being in the same as you owned a cow or a dog. And you could treat a human being under Roman law in the same way as you chose to treat your dog or an animal that you kept in your house. And that in itself is a terrible thing. You know, we, are, we, are, we are catching a glimpse again, I think, um, in, in all the talk that there is in the news of, of modern slavery. Um, slavery has not been eradicated. It's taken on different shapes and forms. Um, but there is... Slavery is rampant throughout the world, and slavery is rampant even in the British Isles in ways that often um, is not seen because we do not move in the right situations and circles. But of course, the second sense in which she was um, a slave was that she wasn't simply enslaved by those who had owned her, who owned her and, and, and had paid money for her, but she is a slave to this this evil spirit that has taken possession of her very life. Uh, the word that you, Luke uses there in, in, in verse 16 where her, uh, he describes the spirit as a spirit of divination. Um, it's, uh, in, in, in the Greek, it, it's a python spirit. Um, and, and python, not in the sense of that snake that you'll find in the Amazon jungle, um, but rather in the, in the sense of 
of the, the Oracle of Delphi that, that is still famous. People still go to the, the city of, of the, the site of Delphi um, where there was an oracle in the ancient world and people um, from all over the ancient world would make the pilgrimage to Delphi to, to hear what the, the Sibyl, as she was called, the Python spirit, would say in answer to their questions in the hope that they may get guidance. It was a kind of, of extravagant form of, um, of, of horoscope and, and fortune-telling. Of course, you had to pay money in order to get the advice that you wanted from this, this supposed messenger from the gods. Um, Luke doesn't enter into any kind of discussion with the, the genuineness of her predictions. That's not what concerns him. Um, but what does concern him is the, the, the fact that there was no doubt about the fact that she was possessed by a demon. She was possessed by an evil spirit. And as we've said before, the, uh, the Bible, even though in our sophisticated age, doesn't like to think about demonic possession, it is a real feature of life in many parts of the world. You speak to, to missionaries who have gone to parts of Africa, missionaries who've gone to some of the unreached people groups um, in, uh, in the Indian Ocean or in South America, uh, and you will find that, that the, the activity, the evidence of demon, demonic activity is all too plain to see, not least when somebody begins to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified to those peoples, that, that very often there is demonic upsurge in the lives of certain individuals who are possessed by evil spirits who react against the very mention of the name of Jesus. But what, of course, is most striking about what happened when she met Paul and his friends is that she was dramatically freed. Dramatically freed. Paul didn't have to dance around, wave his arms, and pronounce magic incantations over her. He simply commanded the spirit to leave. And she was freed in that instant. There's always something particularly fascinating about those whose lives have been so obviously transformed by the grace of God, turned around. They become different people for those of you who are of a certain age, um, uh, a grey-haired age. You, you will probably remember the 1960s and 70s. You will probably remember the name David Wilkerson, um, a, a Pentecostal preacher uh, in New York, who felt a calling from God to, to go to the gangs of New York, as they were then, um, who, were, who were like tribes of young people um, who lived in, in a constant state of warfare. And, and they were armed and they were dangerous. They carried guns and they carried weapons. And, and, and David Wilkerson um, went to those groups, risking his life to do so, and preached Christ to them. And, and to his own amazement, he began to see uh, not only ones and twos, but significant numbers of these gang members turn from the, the life of, of sexual indulgence and of violence that they'd embraced. And, and they, became, they became Christians and they were turned around. And, and one in particular, um, who, who ended up writing his own biography, was Nicky Cruz. <laughs> And, and you read the, the story of Nicky Cruz and, and the description of his life and of what he got up to in so many ways is frightening. And, 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 and humanly speaking, you say this is the last individual on the planet that you would think would even listen to the gospel, let alone re respond to it. And yet Jesus saved him. And, and, and he, he came from being um, effectually, effectively a terrorist in that community where he lived, to being, um, to being an evangelist. Not only to his fellow gang members, but to his former enemies, as he brought Christ to them. So it's helpful, therefore, just to, to try and delve into what's happening in this passage and to see what's taking place in this woman's life. First of all, we are confronted by the all-too-real power of evil, and wickedness in verses 16 and 17. There, there are many things about this girl's tragic life that, that smack of the power of evil and how it tyrannized her and tyrannized others through her, terrorized others through her. Uh, at the most obvious level, there's the, the evil of slavery. 
slavery is described in the Bible because it was a feature of life in the ancient world. It is never, ever condoned in the Bible. It is never, ever commanded in the Bible. It was there as part of a fallen and a sinful world. And we are allowed to catch a glimpse of what that looked like for those who were enslaved and under the the tyranny of their masters and their mistresses in those days. And this poor girl was robbed of her freedom, robbed of her dignity as a human being. She had been reduced to being a chattel, a piece of property. Whether she was taken as a captive of war sold into slavery, perhaps because her parents were finding it impossible to, to make ends meet. And that was, again, was one of the tragedies of life in the ancient world, that if, if, if parents could no longer afford to cover the expenses of family life, that they would um, at times take the horrible decision of, of selecting one of their children and they would sell their child into slavery for money in order that they might survive just a little bit longer or whether she was born into slavery. And, and there were many, many children who were simply born into slavery. Female slaves were often abused by their male masters and owners, would become pregnant, and the children born to them would be, immediately become the property of the slave owner and perhaps be taken from their natural mother and handed on to somebody else to care for other people had exploited her and she wasn't able to resist. She couldn't stop what was being done to her and she couldn't escape. There's no shortage of similar stories today, sadly, despite the fact that slavery as an institution has been abolished around the world. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of examples in our news almost on a daily basis um, of, of people who have been enslaved, people who are being trafficked. You know, we, we are hearing the language of people trafficking today. It's coming to our own shores. It's becoming a, a, a major problem in the Republic of Ireland that's hitting the headlines again and again. It's the big issue that stands at the heart of the upcoming general election. Whenever that happens to be, what are you going to do about the channel crossings? The people traffickers who are bringing... Um, bringing people from other nations into our nation for us to look after them. One of the most ugly faces of evil as it is resident in the human heart is its ability, our ability, to exploit others for our own advantage. To exploit our fellow human beings, to take advantage of them to fail to recognize their human dignity and to treat them like animals for our own gain. And again, it's very easy for us to think um, you are, our, our fingers haven't in the least been dirtied by that. But, but you only have to, to name certain high, ch high street chains where you maybe go to buy your clothes and if you dare to ask the questions, where were these clothes man manufactured and by whom were these clothes manufactured? In the sweatshops of factories in China where child labor is the means of production. Children robbed of their childhood. Children virtually enslaved for little or no remuneration in those situations that other might, others might take advantage of them. There was an even more sinister power at work in this girl, wielded by the evil spirit that had taken control of her life and to which she was at its mercy. And, and it's seen quite literally in, in the manic response that she elicits to Paul when she's challenged. Um, you know, whenever, whenever, um, whenever Paul confronts her um, and, and challenges her, um, uh, she, 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 um, she's crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And, and she was 
shouting this at the top of her voice, following Paul around, interrupting his public ministry. And people knew who she was. And, and, and they, she knew, they knew what was going on within her as, the, as being possessed by an evil spirit. And, and, and their immediate thought would be, well, this is no great adverse, advertisement for the Jesus that Paul is preaching. If, if an evil spirit is saying, this man is preaching Jesus Christ, then a people's instinct would be say, we're not going to believe an evil spirit. Because her effort was to try and discredit the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul was proclaiming. You know, so here were graphic examples of the uncontrollable rulers and authorities and the powers of darkness and the forces of evil that Paul speaks about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse, 7 to verse 12. That we are not to underestimate that the devil is alive and well on planet earth. That the reality of demons and dark spirits, evil spirits at work in our world underlies so much of the awfulness and the wickedness that is increasingly dominating the landscape of our world. Hers was the kind of ruined life that Jesus himself so often encountered during his earthly ministry. People whose lives had literally been torn apart. They were reduced to physical wrecks because of their demon possession. And again, it would be easy for us to pour scorn on the idea of demons, but, but not just, as we mentioned already, the, the, the reports from missionaries of demonic possession in other parts of the world, but you think of what's happening in Britain today, and, and, and you look at what's happening in terms of the world of the occult in Britain today, and, and the, the, uh, especially linked with the New Age movement, there is significant interest in the occult, in the worship of Satan, and in the belief in, in evil powers that can be controlled and used to an individual's advantage. No one should be under any illusion as to its seriousness. But then at the most basic level of all is the power of evil, not merely over this girl as a slave, but the power of evil that is manifest in every human being. Because every human being that is conceived in a woman's womb, a mother's womb, is in the language of the psalmist, conceived in sin, shaped in iniquity. That's speaking about, the nat about human nature. Uh, it's, it's not... Um, it's, it's not speaking about conception outside marriage as a different thing. It's speaking about the fact that every human being conceived in a mother's womb is born with a sinful nature. Born with an inbuilt desire and tendency not to go with God, but to go against God. Not to submit to God, but to defy God. And that's why every parent discovers sooner or later that the one thing you never have to teach your child to do is how to sin. No. How to disobey, how to challenge what they're being told to do. In that sense, she was no different from Lydia. Lydia was a religious sinner and uh, this slave girl was simply a sinner, a slave, who was a sinner. They both had a sinful nature. Lydia concealed it beneath her, her, her um, religious activity by the, the riverbank. But like Lydia, the slave girl heard the word of God, but was unable by herself to respond to it. And there's the great conundrum that we face as we try to understand the Bible's teaching about human nature and human, human, human freedom. So you ask the question, are human beings free? And the answer is, yes, we are free. We were created by God at the beginning to be self-determining creatures. We had the faculty of choice. And, and part of 
the way that God constructed the garden in Eden and placing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden and making it off limits for Adam. It was to put Adam's use of his faculty of choice to the test. How are you going to use your freedom? Are you going to use it to my glory? Or are you going to use it for your own self-indulgence? We are made as self-determining creatures. We have a choice. But there's another sense in which we are not free. We are no freer than that bowl on the bowling green with the bias built into one side of it that it will never go in a straight line. No matter how try hard you try to make the bowl on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on the bowling green run straight, it will always curve off to the right or to the left because it's made that way. So that leads to the the $64,000 question, not merely for this poor girl, but for every human being, how then can I be free from sin? How can I be liberated from this, this, terrible, this terrible bias that has been built into me because of my fallenness, where I'm always going in the wrong direction by nature rather than the right direction? You know, we can be the most polite and respectable sinner on the face of the earth with, with, or the illusion of being the most liberated person in the universe, but secretly we know that in our spirits we are prisoners. We are held captive to dark thoughts, inappropriate thoughts, hard attitudes, stubborn spirits, pride. The list goes on and on. That, that, there, that, that, that only we, if we look in the mirror honestly, know the truth about what's going on inside, not the not the impression that we present outside, that we see that there are things within us that if we are honest, we, we hate ourselves because of them. But it's only whenever we get to the point of seeing that problem within our own hearts that we'll begin to realize where the answer and the liberation comes from, which brings us to the second thing. Um, we see not only the... The, the power of evil, but we see the power of truth, verses 17 and 18. Uh, there can be a great temptation for, for preachers to construct sermon headings in a way that is uh, artificial for neatness' sake, um, but, but that's not the case in, in the, the choice of, of heading for this second point, the power of evil on the one hand, the power of truth on the other. Um, and I say that for several reasons. Uh, the first is seen in what the slave, slave girl was saying, and the way that Paul reacted to her in these three verses. At first sight, her manic ranting seemed to be the very thing that Paul would have wanted people to hear because they sounded true. Um, she's, she's going around and, and, and she is um, proclaiming to, uh, to, to all the people that, that, um, that, 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 that she encounters that, that Paul is, is, is preaching Christ and pointing to Christ um, as, as the one who alone is able to give life and liberty. So, so her, her, her words sounded true. But, but the fact was that what she was saying was anything but true. Because the expression, the most high God, that she uses as she speaks of what Paul is proclaiming, was one that was widely used in the ancient Near East and could refer to any one of a range of gods but especially in Greece and, Greece and Rome, to Zeus and to Apollo, the heads of the pantheon of the gods. That she was speaking about false gods, man-made gods, when she used that language of the god that Paul was proclaiming. Far from endorsing the message that Paul was preaching about the God of the Bible as the Most High God, it simply made the people shrug their shoulders and say, well, if that's good for you, that's fine. If you think it's not Zeus or, or one of the other of the, the, the ancient pantheon and it's, it's a, a, a Jewish God, then that's fine. You know, it's not the 21st century world that discovered pluralism. The pluralism um, of, of, of religion was there all the way through ancient times, New Testament times. We've always lived in a pluralistic world. But the uniqueness of the God of the Bible is self-proclaiming as we encounter him in the pages of the Bible. 
the one thing that had the power to disturb the peace that reigned at that time was the very direct proclamation of the name and the message of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was nothing less than God incarnate. God accommodating himself to a human level to engage with the human race once and for all in a way that would bring deliverance. It didn't, wasn't merely that he had the power to silence the demon, but it, also left, but it also that he left his hearers in no doubt about who Jesus really was. Second reason for this wording of this heading is found in what James Boyce, the late minister of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, who had a, a wonderful ministry there, says at this point in his commentary about the use of this expression in relation to Satan and his ambition for power. Here's where the intersection takes place. Isaiah 14, verse 14, um, Satan, we are told by Isaiah, said in his rebellion against God, as he plotted rebellion in heaven, he said, I will make myself like the most high God. So Satan was the first to use that language. He, he was stating his ambition, I am not going to be like God, I'm going to usurp the place of God. So here was the ultimate self-delusion of Satan. And there is no greater counter to that delusion than to the truth of God taking human flesh and entering our world to dwell among us. So whenever God incarnate walks this earth and, and Satan unleashes legions of demons to torment him and to obstruct his way and to frustrate his work on every turn, Jesus simply has to speak the words and the demons turn tail and fly. Because they are under his sovereign accountability. But the third reason why this, word, this wording is so significant is what Jesus himself says and what Paul may well have remembered. Jesus in John 8 verse 32 says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, verse 32. And then again, verse 36, he goes on to say, and if the Son will set you free, then you will be free indeed. Those are glorious words. Those are some of the most wonderful words in the gospel to a, to a generation that is enslaved in a multitude of ways. If you will know the Son, the Son will set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It's the power of truth, not lies, that liberates and makes us new. But then quickly and, and, and finally, one last point. Here, here in these verses we discover the power of one single conversion. One single, humanly speaking, insignificant conversion. She's only a slave girl. You one might well think that the power of human compassion would actually leave people pleased to see this girl restored, liberated in her own, back to her, her old self. But far from it, the power of human greed meant that the impact of her deliverance actually provoked um, a hostile reaction. It wasn't just that her owners were outraged by their, their loss of income, but the authorities, when they brought their complaint to the local magistrate, the authorities held up their complaint and said, these men are going to be imprisoned for what they've done, for liberating that girl from the demon that possessed her. In other words, this single conversion of an insignificant individual sent shockwaves through the whole community in Philippi, right up to the levels of local government. sobering reminder to us that the transforming power of God's salvation is quite literally a power to be reckoned with, a force to be reckoned with. Not only in the sense of the difference it makes to an individual's life when they experience conversion, but on those around them. One of the stories that stuck with me, and I know I've told you before, but it's worth telling again, because it involves a little boy from Bangor, a little boy from Bangor, who went to a youth camp organized by Scripture Union, um, and he was from a rough area of Bangor, and, and he had, a, he had a, an alcoholic father, and, and he had an awful upbringing, and he was an awful little individual. Um, he was a troublemaker at camp. 
Um, he tried to work, burn down the wardrobes in his dorm in camp. He set fire to them. But before the end of camp, he was converted. And it was a genuine conversion. Because he went back to his own home here in Bangor and he told his father, alcoholic as he was, he says, Daddy, we're going to start family devotions, family devotions from here on. You must read the Bible with us and pray with us. And the whole family came to, came to faith through that child's coming to faith. The gospel transforms individuals and families as well. It affects not only those who experience salvation, but it impacts those bound up with them in friendship and in family. It explains why Paul elsewhere says to Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul and Silas suffered a dreadful injustice by any standard. They liberated a poor girl from demonic possession. They were publicly flogged till their backs ran red with blood. They were then put in, sh in, in, in shackles in the depths of the prison with a guard on the door to make sure they didn't escape. You know, that's the sort of thing that would end up in the human rights court. But Paul and, and Silas weren't sitting grumbling and groaning. What were they doing in the prison? They were singing, singing praises to God, giving thanks to God, even in the midst of their pain. We shouldn't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if our coming to faith in Christ provokes a hostile reaction from surprising people around us. And it reminds us that before we take that step of faith, Jesus says, count the cost. Because it will cost you to be a Christian. Even though such reaction may be somewhat bewildering to us, the reason is more often than not because the people who are our persecutors know in their heart of hearts this is actually what we need. You've got something that's made a difference to your life that I just wish I had. had. But I haven't, got the, I haven't got the courage at this point to say, show me the way. Lindsay Brown, not the Lindsay Brown who was so well known around Bangor, but Lindsay Brown who was the president of International Fellowship of Evangelical Students for much of his, his uh, lifetime, um, said there's nothing like the, the, the power, there's no greater advertisement for the gospel than the sight of a transformed life. A life being turned around from what it was by nature in sin to what it becomes through Jesus Christ and his saving grace. The people, people will come and say, what's come over you? What's the secret to the change? So this second conversion that Luke describes is from the opposite end of the social spectrum from Lydia. She was, she was literally up there uh, working amongst the, the, the upper classes. This poor slave girl who isn't even named She's from the bottom of the social, the social classes. But it's the same gospel. There wasn't one gospel for Lydia in all her prosperity and a different gospel for this poor slave girl in all her poverty. It was one gospel, one Jesus. And he met the needs of both. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And we thank you that there are no barriers beyond which it cannot go. There's no human being who is beyond the reach of grace. And pray, O oh Lord, that in your mercy you will, that you will bless your word, your glorious gospel as it's gone out to the ends of the earth on this your day. And may there be a harvest of souls that will be testifying to what happened to them on this day in their lives. For Jesus' sake, amen.